Okay, so today we are reversing the roles, and now I'm interviewing Byron, and we're going to continue the conversation from uh, the interview we did the other day. So, um, if you haven't listened to that one, I suggest you go back and listen to that one first, and then follow up with this one. So, Byron, um, since we had the conversation the other day, there's been this fight with uh, Mabalgua, where he got knocked out in about thirty seconds. I think that was a, that's a pretty good um, conversation starter. Like we can we can we can talk about that and how how um, you know the the environment, the martial arts environment in China is at the moment. So yeah, what what, what do you think about that fight sure. first of all? Well, you know what was what was a bit weird for me about that fight is that I heard nothing about it leading up to it. I only heard about it after the fact, and I heard about it from people that used that I knew from Xu Xiaodong's gym uh, in a, in a chat group. They just sent through video of, of this fight, and even when they sent it through, I didn't know who was fighting because there were no titles or whatever. I I just saw somebody arriving, and I'm like, "Is that Ma Bao Guo?" And then I was like, "Oh, it is." And then, well, the inevitable happened. So. It's, it's the first thing that's a bit interesting to me is that, okay, he's supposedly a Chinese martial artist, yet this wasn't really even discussed in the Chinese martial arts community. I mean, it wasn't as if news was circulating. Not that, not that anybody really. I mean, it's more like an inside joke within Chinese martial arts in general. But it just shows you as like a contrast between what happened with Xu Xiaodong. I mean, any time Xu Xiaodong just had a discussion or tweeted. Well, the effect, you know, the the equivalent of a tweet here against some Chinese martial artist. It was all over media, social media here. But I heard nothing about this. Did you hear about this beforehand? No, not until、um, Yarick posted it up on Facebook. Do you think this was done purposely? Then purposely kept no, quiet. I don't think- No, I don't think it was kept quiet purposely. Although, I mean, that would make sense in this environment. But it seems like they had all their. You know, they they crossed all their T's and dotted all their I's to to set it up and not not have a problem with it.、Um, so I don't think they deliberately kept it quiet. I just think nobody gave a shit, which is you know that's、uh, par for the course with Ma Bao Guo reality.、Mm-hmm. So I mean, as as far as background, I think everybody already knows who Ma Bao Guo is, and you know about him.、Uh, Having the police intervene with、um, his fight with Xu Xiaodong, and about the the、um, supposed challenge match he had with Peter Irving, which was which、um, was staged. So I don't think we need to go into that. But I mean, this is something that's kind of going on in China quite a lot with these、um, staged fights and and I guess delirious individuals with this kind of. Guru complex or whatever. Like, what what do you think about all this? Like, how is it in like, how is it in China? You know, what do most people think about this and and whatever? Well, you were here. I mean, over the last, I would say that. What didn't you? Wouldn't you say that、um, over the last five or six years, the there's been a distinct and a sharp rise in nationalism? Yeah, yeah. definitely. And.、Uh, Yeah, and I, you know, through that period,、uh, anything connected to the national identity has also been somewhat exaggerated and pumped up. So, of course, Chinese martial arts, and at the pinnacle of that, in terms of, you know, the, the Chinese martial art that is probably the most well known and probably holds a position. Within Chinese commun, the Chinese society as well as the international community at a higher level would be Tai Chi Chuan. So that has been pushed up to even greater heights through this whole nationalism, you know,、uh, agenda that's been going on, as you know, for the last six years. So the first thing that that we kind of noticed was a distinct push. In all aspects in China, to push up the well, the image of Chinese martial arts to connect it to the image of the Chinese people, right? And by default, the country, because that's the. I mean, let's be honest. That's the political.、Um, that's the political basing that they, or、well, the framing that they do with with everything. Anything the, the government is the people, or, or rather. The 
government is the race. That's a better way to put it. The government is the race. So they've been, there's been a, a distinct push to, to elevate these things, and by default, the, the government, to be honest. So this, is, this, is, this has been going on for a while. So we started seeing it in terms of just how uh, this, there was a lot more focus on Taiji and its profound uh, benefits and its long history and its amazing culture. That was slightly increased over the last six years. I mean, I don't know if you, you saw the same thing. Yeah. And, and then, yeah. And then from there, it just went on because what you what they did was they emboldened like people like Ma Bao Kuo and others that that you know already are are in that mindset with with themselves and Taiji. It emboldened them to push themselves even higher. And of course, no one's going to talk against their claims or their well. Let's be honest, their 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 bullshit ideas and their. Because if, if you try to counter that, by default, you're countering the direction that the whole country is going in, in terms of its pushing up of this national identity through Tai Chi or to, through Chinese martial arts. So these guys firstly got emboldened, and then because they weren't challenged, they just started coming out of the woodwork one after the other to, you know, these, to act the way that these people are acting, to make claims of superiority and skill, to make claims in superiority of martial prowess and they're all based on nothing but hot air in the, in, in the in the vast cases and this all culminated with what happened with Xu Shadong a couple of years ago mm. uh, you know we we in the west we heard about it we heard about it only after the fact people in the west but for us here Xu Shadong was simply he was simply amongst all of this bullshit that was running around in in the media and and uh, and in general society about Tai Chi and these magical superpowers. I mean, do you see that uh, Jin Kung Fu TV show? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where Lele first... That's the first time we really saw Lele and, and he was making all these claims and then everybody was like, well, who is this guy? He's not... I mean, I'd never heard of him before that. I don't know if, if you had, but he didn't seem to be somebody who was a known figure in China. Not at all. He's a nobody. I mean, he really was a nobody. Um, but that wasn't the first episode where somebody was, you know, showing magical powers, superpowers, you know? So that show had been running for a while, and every episode was presented to be some kind of documentary, something real. But it was all staged nonsense from the, the token Westerner that comes in with an arrogant attitude, acting like something, you know... That uh, you know, a caricature of a yeah. They were playing. On, they were playing yeah. on history, weren't yeah. they? And this whole you know, yeah. Western strongman belittling the sick man of Asia, and you know, that's the the right. the, uh, the theme of a lot of Hong Kong movies. So I think they were playing on that, knowing that this is something Chinese people feel passionate about. Yeah. Well, at least with Hong Kong movies, it's presented as a work of fiction. This mm. was presented as a documentary and supposed to be real. And I mean, they had token white guys like doing other martial arts magically, whether it was Thai boxing or Krav Maga or something. And uh, they were, they'd show you like this guy beating up other people, he's really good and acting all arrogant. And then he meets whatever the style is in question for that episode. He meets a master who totally destroys him and humbles him, but also goes on to show some magical powers. and. And then the, the, the token Westerner is now totally in awe and converted and wants to learn and humbled. And I mean, so for me, even the Lele issue in that episode was just another episode of a bullshit show. You, you get what I'm saying, mm -hmm. right? So, but, but what I'm trying to get at is this is the environment that was running around here. It wasn't like Lele appeared out of nowhere and Xu Dong was like, I'm going to mess this guy up. It was an environment of all sorts of things like this. That was one show. There was a series of, um, of shows made with the uh, connection to Wang Zhanhai and the Chen Taiji clan that was showing him against a judoka. And he goes into a school and, and a black belt judo guy, he can't throw him and he eventually throws the judo guy. Then he goes off to a fencing group and 
He defeats fences with Tai Chi Chen, like, you know, professional fences. There was even a video of him thwarting a group of fences simultaneously. That seems to have disappeared because I have a really tough time finding that now. Mm. Uh, there was even a ridiculous one that is is deliberately being hidden because this was all connected. I don't know if you remember that uh, Tai Chi Zen endeavor by Jet Li. Oh yeah, they did that whole thing with Jack Ma, didn't they? And is, right. is that what it is? Right. Yes, it's all connected to that. So they had Wang Chan Hai doing all these crazy demonstrations as part of their promotion. So, I, I, you know, since the whole Lele thing, a lot of that stuff has disappeared from YouTube. Meanwhile, before they were, they were promoting it, and even from their own channel. There was a video of him alone defeating a rugby team at rugby. I mean, you couldn't make this shit up. You know, f for us as Westerners, we look at it and you're like, come on, man. You know, who do you think you're fooling? But the sad part is they are fooling people. Mm -hmm. That's the sad part. Not us, not most of us that are, you know, of a different mindset coming from the West, but they are literally fooling people here. And that was going on. That was the environment here. You had uh, uh, Chen Shaowong do a demonstration against uh, the strong, Asia's strong man that he couldn't move him by pushing him. I'm sure you saw that. Yeah, too. I remember that one. Yeah, yeah that was. So, so that was the environment and it kind of came to a head at that time when, when, when the Lele Xu Dong fight occurred. So, you know, it wasn't, once again, a lot of unfortunate, you know, they, there's a lot of Western martial, Chinese martial artists that are looking for some sort of uh, excuse for what occurred. You know, they're trying to either paint a picture of Xu Dong as some negative person or that this was a deliberate, you know, ploy by him for fame or for money or that he's some sort of a, a, a cretin because of what he did. Meanwhile, they don't even understand that the environment was already like this. I was sick and tired of seeing such deliberate, misleading um, stuff being, being made in general, just out of this whole push to pick up Chinese culture and Tai Chi and, you know, I was sick of seeing it. So, so they don't understand this is what happened. And, and the last thing we need is you know, don't, don't shoot the messenger, you know, and Xu Dong in many aspects was a messenger in that, in that regards. Mm. Uh, and but they want to shoot the messenger. it's sort of backfired though, hasn't it? Because now, now um, he, you know, that on social media and all over the internet, people are saying that Xu Dong has um, defrauded martial art masters and he's beaten up everybody in, in Kung Fu and that Kung Fu is useless and irrelevant and so I feel like it, it's also kind of um, had a, it, it's created like a negative perception of Chinese martial arts in the West at the same time. You mean their reaction? You mean their reaction or what Xu did in the first place? Well, the reaction to the, the reaction to um, the fights that he's had. Well, you know, I was having a discussion and uh, with a, with a friend. Um, on, a, on a, a related topic about how things are dealt with, not only in Chinese society, but just as a government here as well. Like, if something is an inconvenience, well, even if it's natural, they'll try to block it with all their, with all their efforts. I mean, you can see that how, how the internet is, is managed here. So, it's, it's literally, people, you, you can't, if you're going to try to stop natural things from occurring, you're going to spend so much energy and you have to do it so hard all the time just to, to try block something like that, that eventually it's going gonna, it's gonna to turn on you, exactly what you just said. It's like, trying to, it's like trying to stop the sun from rising, I mean, if that was possible. Uh, you know, you're, you're literally, you're fighting a losing battle and in the end you're going to get burnt. I mean, that's what's happened. So... A lot of, in a lot of cases, as you said, it backfired. Of course it backfired because, I mean, people that have a logical mind will look at it and see it, see it for what it is, looking at all the information that's come out during that time and after, and then just looking at the general field and, you know, uh, and, and seeing what happened. Of course it's going to have a negative reaction. And the sad part is that these people like Lele and uh, Ma Bao Guo are not really the representatives of the majority of Chinese martial artists. They really aren't, but they're, they're, 
they're now seen as a representation of all Chinese martial arts. And right, that's probably right. that's, part that's, of that's the what reason. I was getting at. Yeah. And that's it's probably almost part become, of the reason. Oh, sorry, there's a bit of a, a connection delay, I think. No problem. Um, yeah, what I think it's almost become is like a battle of cultures in that, you know, it, it, it's pitting Chinese culture against Western culture, as in Chinese martial arts against um, Western mixed martial arts. So it's kind of become something much bigger, I think, now. Well, yeah, for sure it has. But that, I mean, that's already... Yeah, I, I remember when the first delay, uh, that match happened. So uh, a little background. You know that I know Xu Xiaodong. And, and here's how I know Xu Xiaodong. Before even all of this occurred, I had started doing grappling and jiu-jitsu quite a while before that. And my, th- my teacher that, was, that I was uh, training jiu-jitsu with, um, he used to teach in Xu Xiaodong's gym a couple of times a week. So Xu Xiaodong's got some tough guys, and um, it was an additional place to go. And I like to, you know, if you keep grappling or if you keep wrestling or if you keep sparring with the same people over and over again, it kind of defeats the purpose. So I used to go as often as I could to spar with and to, and to you know, grapple with uh, some other people. So I used to go to this the Xu Xiaodong's gym just so I could grapple with, with his guys when my teacher was teaching there a few days a week. So, I mean, I, I'm going to go a little bit in depth here, but my, my experience with Xu Xiaodong over this period uh, before all of this occurred was that he's a really nice guy. Actually, if you, if you know him personally, He's not like he's portrayed in general. He's actually a very nice guy. He's crude-mouthed. Yes, I agree. He speaks with a very crude mouth. Um, He's rough at the edges, but in general, he's an overall nice guy. He's not a a bad-hearted, mean-streaked person at all. Um, Okay, if you're fighting, you're fighting, and that's a different story. But in general, he's he's a good guy. So I remember when all of this was leading up to this Lele thing, and it was no big deal. Really, it it wasn't even a big deal in his gym. He had a social media, and this is the other part that people don't realize. He had this online kind of like a social social media chat group. And uh, actually, Lele came in there running his mouth after uh, after this episode of him doing all those magical feats came out. And he started saying things like, he can defeat MMA, and he can, he can uh, defeat a, a, a rear naked choke with one hand, a fully locked up rear naked choke, he can escape with one hand. And I mean, we all know once a rear naked choke is completely locked up, it's usually lights out, you know, this that, that, don't escape at that point, you escape before it's fully locked up, otherwise if it's getting locked up, you're in trouble. Um, and he even posted a video with, I don't know, he used a skeleton and tried to show some weird quasi mechanics and anatomy theory. And he had a student that put a very poor rear naked choke on him that he got out of on the camera. And that's when it started. And Xu Xiaodong was like, oh, really? Well, how about you try it with me if you're so sure of yourself? And that's what happened. And the day before he actually went down to, to Sichuan to... To fight, I mean that was the first time I heard about uh, this match con- that was going to take place. And uh, the day after, I was in his gym. He came back, and it was nothing serious because it hadn't exploded yet, right? I saw it, and it was nothing serious. Uh, and he was Shu Xiaodong was back in there doing his normal, you know, acting normal. And I just asked him about it. I said, "So how did uh, you know? I saw the match." Uh, he said, yeah, it went exactly as he thought it would go. He said, except that he, he really wanted to choke him. He wanted to choke Lele just to show him that his concepts about this uh, rear naked choke were ridiculous. But it even get to that. It yeah. just hit him a couple of times and that was the end of that. So that was it. That was all we thought about it. That was all we thought about it. And, um, you know, uh, then it just exploded everywhere. And uh, you, the, the subsequent sh- uh, shit show that occurred. So... And the, and the, the subsequent shit show was 
had nothing to do with a, a match or the fact that somebody had a fight or it was directly related to the belittling of the name of Taiji and by default this uh, whole endeavor of uh, nationalism tied to Tai Chi and Tai Chi culture being shown to be exactly what you said, this East versus West thing, and now this is MMA or Western concept, and it's destroyed Tai Chi, which they're pumping up as some almost, uh, what's the word? Uh, Shin, geez, my English is... Uh, like the spirit of Tai Chi? No, divine. Some divine, oh, divine right. martial, yeah, some divine martial martial art of superior abilities being beaten by this Western thing. So that was the key here. And Xu Xiaodong just happened to be the poor sod that was uh, that was on the MMA side. So by default, he, he's the he's the devil in all of this, you know. Mm-hmm. And and that's ex- it's exactly as you said. And, and it just carried on from then. And I remember at that time. One of my 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 jujitsu my jujitsu uh, brothers, when we watched the video of Xu Dong and then he said to me, "Why are Chinese people so?" He's an American. He said, "Why are Chinese people so surprised about this?" This question was answered in you with UFC one. You know, why? What's what's going on? And I'm like, well, they didn't have UFC here, you know. So that that's part of it too, you know. I mean. Say what you will about MMA as a sport. Those age-old questions and the original UFC was trying to put on a spectacle and to answer those age-old questions of which style is better, which rules. And it's not to say that one style is because the end result and the answer is that, first of all, it's not really the style, it's the stylist. And second of all, yes, certain aspects of combat have to be covered if you don't know them. If you're not well-rounded, they, somebody's going to take advantage of that aspect that you lack and you're going to lose because of that. So, you know, these questions were answered and, and the process that's gone through with, with the sport has become its own thing, but it has answered a lot of these questions and it's shed some insight onto the reality of, of combat. Now, some people might want to say that MMA is a sport and it's full of rules, but I'll remind them that the first UFCs had no rules in in reality. They were very, mm. very minimal. You know, they were they were a lot closer. And I'll also remind them that MMA as a combat sport is still a lot freer than most, mm. almost all the other sport disciplines. So if if somebody says that they practice Tai Chi push hands to develop combat ability and they don't see the irony in saying that MMA has got rules, then they might want to take a close look in the mirror. Yeah. So, yeah, it just it just seems kind of interesting that since you know since all this kind of blew up, um, they've just kind of continued to dig themselves deeper, and rather than just you know maybe putting some money into having more uh, Chinese martial artists going and cross training in MMA and, and trying to make a name in UFC or something, I mean you've got you've got Zhang Wei Li, but. But other than that, it's there's not really that much um, being done on that front, and instead they just seem to be kind of burying their heads in the sand more, and and kind of just continuing this whole thing, and at the same time just trying to shut Xu Xiaodong up and, and other people, which is then only making it worse. You know what I mean? Well, they're only making it worse for us that are on the outside, the people here that. Firstly, have a different mentality, and secondly, have a different uh, are not don't have access to information. For them, in in the large part, it's it's not worse. That that's what I'm saying. If you can if you can control the bubble, it's not going to be worse. The problem is that outside of this bubble, we see it for what it really is, and they have made it worse. Yes, and and you know, it's it's. I mean, we could go into a whole discussion about how low they actually I, I don't want to say too much but how low they stooped officially to get revenge on Xu Xiaodong mm. I mean it, it's almost inhumane what they did to the guy mm. I mean laws went out the window pros, process and due, due, due process never occurred the guy was guilty for anything just because it's him I think I mentioned to you I, I interviewed uh 
Zhang Weili in December, and uh, in my my introduction part of that, I mentioned Xu Xiaodong and put a photo on that video. And when I try to upload that interview, which is really trying to pick up the the understanding amongst all this confusion of Chinese martial arts, I interviewed her to do that, and I uploaded that to a local video site in China and was blocked. It's never been allowed simply because it has Xu Xiaodong's face in it. I mean, it's like living. People don't realize we're living in. It's like kind of Narnia, you know. It's a, mm. it's a, <laughs> it's another reality that that they can't understand. So they don't get it. For them, they think this is the way you deal with it. You know, when you, you deal with inconvenience or somebody that's、uh, showing you something you don't like, irrespective of him being right or wrong. This is how they deal with it. But for us, it just makes things, you know, all the much worse for you. So yeah. But there, there is also. I mean, this is you know, as far as for like the the domestic audience, you could say that they've successfully、uh, dealt with Xu Xiaodong and dealt with this issue. But as far as like global soft power, because you know, like the Confucius Institute and and Chen Village, Shaolin Temple, Wu Dan, they really are trying to push this kind of、um, martial mysticism globally. So you know, they've really shot themselves in the foot there. Well, this was this was the problem. This was exactly exactly all those initiatives that you just said. They were centralized. This is what people don't realize. It was part of the soft power initiative. It was a di- it wasn't oh just oh by the way, Tai Chi seems to be popular. It was actually a planned endeavor to use Chinese martial arts and Tai Chi specifically as part of the soft power. It's actually part of the One Belt One Road initiative. People don't even know that Tai Chi is in there.、Mm. Uh, the Confucius Institutes as well, Tai Chi, but Chinese martial arts in general.、Uh, all of these things were official endeavors. Now you've gone and you've sullied the name of this thing. You know, you've kind of shown that the emperor has no clothes.、Uh, it's it's. You know, for them it was like panic mode. Meanwhile, they don't realize that most Westerners. Don't associate those two things like they did. You know, I mean, sure, there's a lot of deluded Westerners within Chinese martial arts as well. But most people didn't believe in magical superpowers for the most part. So the Xu Xiaodong issue for a lot of Westerners, especially Tai Chi people in the West, where a lot of them are doing it simply as a health exercise, they weren't really bothered. You know, as long as they're going to stop doing Tai Chi.、Um, But I would say that the what you said about them making it worse has maybe made even those people, you know,、uh, a little bit disgusted, and、uh, that that's no good for Chinese martial arts as a whole, for sure. So yeah, and you know that, I mean, when this whole thing came out with Xu Xiaodong, it exploded. It became a Tai Chi versus MMA thing. Then everybody and his uncle over here that was involved in Tai Chi or Chinese martial arts, but mostly Tai Chi, started attacking Xu Xiaodong. And then even down to I can't recall who from the Chen family made a statement saying that Tai Chi is not for fighting, but it for health. I think that was actually、um, Chen Shaowang himself, or, or was it Chen Junglei? Maybe. I think it was Chen Junglei.、Mm. I think it was Chen Junglei. But you know, Xu Xiaodong. You know, and and anybody. Okay, if you're saying that it's only for health now, then why are you putting on these shows of you destroying ch- judo people, fencing people? The strong man of Asia cannot push you. That's not. Those aren't health endeavors. What、yeah. are you talking about? You and when you, when you know, when Chen style first? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I was just going to say when Chen style first sort of came out and began to grow popular outside of China, they initially they were marketing it as. You know the fighting style of Tai Chi, weren't they? Right. You know because right, it's, the got fighting, the, it's got the it's got the Tai Chi hard、way. version. Right. Yeah, because it's the Tai Chi hard version. You know they wanted to say that it's、uh, more connected to combat application.、Mm. But th- that's where they that's where they messed up. And, and unfortunately, Xu Xiaodong hit a nerve there because what he did was he then he then. Answered this and actually basically wanted to have a challenge with anybody of the Chen. I mean, there was a lot of back and forth. There was a lot of insults coming up and down.、Um, and he, then he said, "Okay, well, I don't mind if the Chen people want to fight. I'll, you know, I'll fight Chen Junlei." Or、uh, I think it was Wan Zhanhai himself because Xu Xiaodong highlighted this thing 
about those fake demonstrations, and and then and then this uh, this so-called uh, challenge went out to the Chen people, and that is when the central the Chinese Bush Association got um, ruffled about this, and that's when they started to issue orders that such matches cannot happen without uh, sanctioning and started to put up blocks, but also. You know, steps were taken to make Xu Xiaodong's life hell, and it was a deliberate thing. And uh, and you know, my my understanding and my experience is that, you know, the Chen village and that whole county Wenxian Wenxian, where the Chen village is, th- that place was dirt poor before mm. Tai Chi tourism took place, right? So you've got soft power, which is connected to the pushing up of Tai Tai Chi as a as a part of the Chinese culture. And an endeavor to, and, and then you've got an entire county whose whose income, you know, is connected to Tai Chi. And then you've got this guy who's basically gonna. I mean, people come with all sorts of perceptions of uh, martial prowess to learn, both domestically and from international, to go to do Chen, uh, to do uh, to the Chen village. So they then they then decided to you know squash this because. If a challenge match had to go ahead between him and somebody from the Chen village, and he wins, it's probably going to affect all of those things and the income or the financial growth of the of Wenxian. So, you know, I personally I think they overthought it. But I mean, if if your entire income is based on a a misleading concept, then you know, maybe there's something wrong with your income method. I guess you know that's me personally. But, yeah. Well, th- this is this current. is a, a a big thing that sort of complicates it more. That I think a lot of people don't necessarily realize is that Henan Province is probably one of China's. I'd say maybe one of the poorest provinces. Um, mm. And you know, the areas like that are, are, are really poor, and there was a lot of famines and stuff, even in recent history. And as much right. as you know, we in the West could criticize like the commercialization of Shaolin Temple or Chen Village or whatever. You know, that has literally saved people's lives, like, de- you know, developing the economy with tourism and, and stuff because of these things. Right. So it's really thrown these, these poor regions a lifeline. But yeah, like you say, you know, it, it's, it's, it's really, it's a complicated issue and, and um, They've kind of dug them, digging themselves deeper at the same time, you know. Well, I don't know. I mean, you've lived here long enough to to attest to this this idea. It's, I mean, wouldn't you say that the 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 idea of face within Chinese culture and their their pride that's attached to it. It's, it's very seldom that you'll get somebody, even when shown to be wrong, and he knows he's wrong himself, to actually say it. They yeah, and just I think this down. is the big issue here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They will, they will and, refuse and to admit they're wrong and sort of continue stumbling forward. Yeah, correct. I mean, I remember, like, many, many times, and this is something that if you don't live here and you don't live here for a long time, you probably wouldn't notice, but... I remember even sitting on the subway once and, um, you know, the, the person sitting next to me was at the end of the bench, which is right next to the door where people get on the subway, right? And there's a small railing there. And this mother had her, he wasn't very young, but he wasn't very old. He was probably around, I don't know, maybe he was nine or 10 years old, her son. And he was drinking, uh, you know, a juice box with a, with a straw. And he was uh, very close to the railing, standing next to the person sitting next to me at the end of the at the end of the bench. And she was on her phone. This person sitting next to me, and mother was basically holding the son. He, he was standing in front of her, so she was holding him. Uh, he was. They were both standing, but she was holding his shoulders. And he was drinking the juice box, and he took the straw out of his mouth. And he, you know, kids. I mean, I've done it. I remember doing it too. You squeeze the juice box because you're thinking something else and some juice comes flying out of the straw, right? And it comes flying out the straw and lands on this girl's mobile phone next to me. And she's, she, she was, it was all over the screen. And she looks up because she's sitting at the kid and she's looking at both the mom and the kid. 
and there wasn't even a word uttered or even a gesture to try dry or nothing she just looked up looked at her phone there was no sorry from the the mom or trying to help clean it up there was no instruction to the child i'm now i come from a background that if i had done that my mother would have told me uh, she would have also apologized but told me to apologize right i mean that, that's that's how you set this as a as a habit but I'm not trying to I'm not trying to paint a negative picture but this is quite common here mm, you know mm, this type yeah, of yeah. this reluctancy to admit faults and be apologetic about it mm. they'd rather double down on it you know so it's it's very common and this this really did happen with all of this whole situation so it spirals when you start doubling down and then there's more factors involved it starts to spiral downward in a very very ridiculous way um You know, do you know that Shusha Dong's gym was uh, closed after many months of all of this nonsense? Yeah, yeah, I, I heard about that. Right. Yeah. Do you know why it was closed? Well, not exactly, but <laughs> because well, of these you, events, you, I guess. <laughs> no, you, you who's uh, lived in China will, will be able to read between the lines. The fire department came and said that it wasn't safe and didn't meet the the, the requirements, and they closed it down. Ah, right. Yeah, it, it's pretty much like the whole what's going on here in Australia now. That suddenly Australian barley is like, oh no, Australian beef is suddenly not good enough. Uh, doesn't meet China's uh, requirements, and they're suddenly not well, um, yeah. importing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so that that I mean I mean that's. The environment that I'm surprised Xu Shadong has gone on as long as he has doing this, and not lost his mind. You know, um, he is ostracized. He has gone through hell, but I think it's exactly because it became an international issue mm. that he's he has survived it. Had it remained a domestic issue, I think the weight of everything against him would have crushed him. That's that's all I think. It's because of the international attention. And in fact, a lot of the um, positive feedback. There was a lot of positive feedback from quite a few Chinese as well. Usually, people that are not connected to, and actually, a lot of the uh, uh, MMA people, etc., people that are involved in other sports, they, and youngsters involved in them. But I think without without the international feedback, I don't think he would have made it. I think he would have been crushed by all of this, both emotionally and probably in other aspects too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, I mean, this kind of leads us quite nicely into the next thing that I want to talk to you about, which is your involvement in the Martial Art Association. And um, I remember you had some frustrations. Oh, before, before we get on to that, before we get on to mm. that, I wanted to, I, actually, this came to, this, and sorry to cut you off, no, but okay. I, I think it's quite, an it's quite an important thing with related, that's related to this Mapa Boy incident. Um, And, and it is connected to the Wushu Federation and the whole official thing, etc. Here, when this when this issue happened with Mabao Guo on a couple of international uh, Facebook pages, martial arts Facebook pages, some people even involved in in Wushu sport were posting it and uh, discussing it. And, you know, I, firstly, I don't see what they're going to discuss. There's not much to discuss. The seventy old man, that guy. I knew what the result would be in any case, but. Mm. It made me have an idea. Something came into my mind, and it would be something good, like a type of a thought experiment for people to try to see, to, to get a different perspective on on this whole situation with Chinese martial arts, particularly here. Let's let's and in general, to be honest. But uh, think, go 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 along with me on this. All right, mm. we've got MMM, and it's pretty well developed today, right? And and a lot of gyms are all over the place, and not all of them, Everybody that does MMA is necessarily wanting to compete, right? They they train it to get some skills in real combat. They spar. Maybe they'll enter small tournaments. Not everyone enters tournaments, but they do regularly spar. Whether they're doing MMA or or an extraction of it with one of the disciplines, it's very very popular. And these people are learning practical combat applicable methods in a very quick time, and it's it's popular. I mean, you'd you'd agree, correct? Mm, 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 mm. Yeah. So, and I don't know if you've seen how even jujitsu or a lot of uh, Thai boxing, etc., is taught. Like a, a usual class would be that uh, warm up aside, 
you start to do set uh, the, the the teacher will will teach a technique of the day or some scenario of the day that you'd work on and you'd either work on it uh, individually or with a partner usually with a partner in a cooperative manner to to understand the scenario and then to to understand the, the the technique and its principles and to try it out to feel it in a controlled in a controlled manner with a partner mm. and then usually after that for example in jiu jitsu then you'll have open mat where people will do free sparring mm. so it's a, it's quite a set it's quite a set thing now take the free sparring out of it if we had to uh, if we had to now have a situation where mma from today forward as a sport had had it has its combat sport aspect eliminated in other words for some reason or another the competition component of of fighting of free fighting has been removed mm. so you, you have a situation where and, and that people are only well leading from this they would then maybe continue practicing but all they do is individual techniques and controlled partner work mm -hmm. right and and what would naturally happen is without the crucible of free fighting uh, and possibly competition as well, but at least free fighting within within the gym, you'd see that there'd be a shift in terms of training over a period of time. That techniques would would start to be focusing on method and the aesthetic uh, aspect of it, how it's how it's done with a focus on how it looks, right? Yeah. I mean, this would be a natural thing that happens, right? So if it had to carry on for 10 years or 20 years, and then suddenly another discipline, a fighting discipline that hasn't stopped with free combat or sparring challenges an MMA person, what do you think the result would be? Yeah, of, of yeah, course, of course, yeah. Correct. So at the end of the day, it's not the problem with the with the art itself it's got a lot to do with the environment and this is going to lead me on to another thing i was working for the international Wush federation i was involved in the sport for a very long time and one of my issues and, and looking back at the picture of chinese martial arts development in china from the from the you know, the republican era until today if you could see there's a there's something that's that's occurred in the republican era there was a shift to have uh they started to try create a sporting event you know uh, uh, with forms they had some uh fighting competitions etc it was the it was the em at an embryonic stage it had just started right, but right, then they had yeah. a civil war right they had a civil war then you had new government come in which totally did not want to have any formalized fighting events in fact they looked down on on formalized fighting and they focused only on forms mm. well this is part of the reason why a lot of chinese martial arts has lost or not only just lost because i won't say it's you know we had the same thing with judo coming out of classical jiu-jitsu classical jiu-jitsu and then jigoro kano who created judo the key the key difference was not simply in the techniques that uh that were practiced they, they for the most part overlap they they all mm. his judo techniques come from classical jiu-jitsu ju right but when they did have a match between kodokan people and the classical ryu of uh jiu-jitsu the kodokan guys for the most part won and the reason wasn't because i once i, I would say that there obviously is uh I mean, there's technical uh, differences between people, but the core reason for that was that the Kodokan people had something that didn't really exist in classical jiu-jitsu, and that's randori, which is free sparring. Mm. So free sparring and sport is an avenue. It's not the perfect avenue, but it is an avenue to push an art, specifically a combat art, up to, to higher levels. Um, right. You can't do yeah. everything in there. Just like... Classical jiu-jitsu includes a lot of techniques and even strikes that aren't in judo, but it will elevate certain parts of it. Now, Chinese martial arts was one of the only ones that didn't really have that in its place of origin. That would be China. Mm. Japan had judo competition that emerged, kendo competition that emerged, karate competition that emerged. Muay Thai has always had... Um, fights and then it became a professional sport but chinese martial arts didn't have this so there's this vacuum here there's this there's this lack of it's kind of 
it's, it, I wouldn't say that it's it's lost something because this stuff didn't exist if you go back hundreds of years ago in any of these martial arts regular free fighting that wasn't a thing in any of them mm. but it's been left behind by these arts in an aspect that is crucial to its combatability that that's just the unfortunate truth now the the reality isn't is that this is addressable it really is addressable the chinese and the chinese wushu association specifically and then the international federation kind of realized this when they tried to decide to create sanda but once again this was done completely independently of the people doing well they had already changed what wushu forms were it had become its own thing and it's now a new division that has nothing to do with that so even though you're trying to create a combat uh, format you've disconnected it already from your core your chinese martial artists Wushu sport has been disconnected from the traditional practitioners for a long time as well. So there's this disconnect and this lack of development. I've gone on on a long tirade, but I thought I'd, I'd share those ideas with you. Yeah, yeah, I think that was that's really that's a really interesting insight. Because um, yeah, um, we were talking the other day about um, what you were trying to do in the in, within the martial art association. Um, do you want to yeah. maybe tell us a little bit about that? Well, so, I mean, I became a member of their technical... I've been a judge since 2004, international judge, and I judged for them many times between that period and when I became a technical committee member, which was 2011. And over this period, I mean, even through my own experience because of my background, I had a background in sport wushu, uh, being young as well, and then I moved on solely to focus on traditional traditional wushu and 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 do it with luckily enough with a teacher who's very deep within traditional wushu so perspective you know it gives you a different perspective over the years and through my understanding the deep involvement with the sport seeing where the cracks and the problems were you know i came to the realization that first of all like i just said you've got two main divisions within chinese martial arts as a as a, a sport under the international body. Mm. There's there's Taolu and there's Sanda. So you've got forms competition and Sanda competition. And there's no connection between the two. It's actually impossible for an athlete to compete in both. Uh, the competitions are set up in a way that it, that's not possible. But Taolu has become its own thing when it uh, when it's uh, started focusing on gymnastic elements. So Nandu and the degree of difficulty techniques are what are core. If you can't do them, you can't win. So at any point, you're, you're not really going to focus on anything but making sure you nail those uh, jumping and aerial and acrobatic techniques. Uh, over and above that, the, the, the core requirements outside of those techniques, in terms of traditional techniques, there is none in reality. When you look at what they have is, uh, I'm, I'm getting a bit technical here, but when you look at what they have in terms of required content, compulsory content, it includes things like dingjo, nailing elbow. This is this is for changchun, for long fist, for mm. example. Dingjo, nailing elbow. Gungbu, mabu, pulbu, shubu. You know, those five stances, mm. right? So, uh, you know, things like that. So those aren't even traditional techniques. They're parts of traditional techniques. You, you know as a traditional person, there's no such thing as a single um, a movement called mabu. Right. It's something, right? I mean, the, the classical technique is is includes mabu as an element of that technique, and it's usually a, as a transitional method. Right, it's so like a, it's a whole a body um, posture or transition, like you say, yeah, yeah. Correct. So I was looking at this over the years, and I'm like looking at all of these root problems, and I'm like, okay, look, I'm not going to. I'm not going to be able to fix Rome in a day. You know, there's a lot of problems. There's a lot to unpack there. We've gone down a road in a in a very long direction. And in fact, the previous chairman of the technical committee that I worked under, actually, he himself had somewhat understood this problem and come to the realization that some changes need to be made. So, we were trying to, at the very least, start with trying to address the content and ensure that it comes. If you're doing Tai Chi then we will, we will ensure that it comes from Tai Chi Chuan. What is Tai Chi? Let's, let's have a definition. Well, let's, let's understand that Tai Chi is Chen, Yang, Wu, Sun, and, and Wu. Let's at least agree on those five styles. If we can agree on that, then we can identify content because 
what what compromises Chen style? Well, there's a few core core routines, for example, that we all or most of the Chen people will agree on. Methods of execution might vary slightly, but in general, we can agree. Yang and these other styles, it's even easier because most of them only had one long form. All right, so let's limit your content that you perform to techniques that exist there. And, and this is, I'm going again more deep than we should go in this mm -hmm. discussion, but this was the basic idea to start applying to everything, to Nanquan, to Changquan, which Changquan is probably the hardest out of all of them because it's become just some gymnastic right. yeah. flip-flap running around doing acrobatics. And the weapons as well. I mean, you can see that Dao and Jian, broadsword and straight sword, there's no difference now no. in uh, <laughs> elite level competition. Mm. So, so this was this was what we and we were we were getting there. But you know, I realized at some point that it was um, it was somewhat turning the environment here in China on its head. Had we been successful to do that, because they've got a, a couple of generations of athletes that became coaches and then. And then another generation of that that don't even know that content. All they know is the, f the, the basic sport content with a focus on Nandu. So by already, by making this a requirement, you've already got a lack of, you're going to have a very hard time to implement it. It's going to turn everything. It's like everybody will have to go back to school. Everybody will have to go back to school. So, uh, and, and that's why I just, I got heavy opposition towards the end. The chairman was changed for political reasons. The new chairman tried to throw the whole thing out the window. I started clashing with him about that. And that was the end of me in that environment as well. So, you know, that's the long and the short of what happened with me. Um, but it just shows you there's a reluctance, even, even when it's logically shown, there was a reluctance to address it. So, yeah. Hmm. I don't know if that's what you wanted to talk about. But yeah, 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 pretty much. It was just to hear, hear your insights into the association and the goings on. Um, so let's now switch to, because we haven't really talked about anything, any traditional martial arts um, today. Right. Um, I remember that when we finished the interview that I did, the podcast that I did on your channel, um, we were going to talk about the Cultural Revolution. So let's let's go right. there. Um so a lot of people, there's a lot of this talk, you know, that the Cultural Revolution destroyed Chinese martial arts or that, you know, the traditional culture here was all lost and that it's only preserved, say, in Taiwan or Hong Kong or Malaysia. Um, obviously, it's a lot more complicated than that. And um, I think that's a pretty interesting topic that we can go into. So For um, sure. For from sure. the point of view of your teacher, I mean, he the same as my teacher he lived through the cultural revolution so um right. yeah maybe you could say something about that well I'll, I'll i mean speaking from my teacher's um experience i i mean I, this should shed some insight into into the situation my teacher obviously started training before the cultural revolution so here you've got people that bridged this this uh period before during and after right so you might have somebody outside of China that is going to say um, the Cultural Revolution destroyed everything, but their perspective might have only been from outside of China. They don't actually know what happened here or after the fact. So they don't really know what, what, what it was like beforehand, right? Um, but I, it, like your teacher and many others, this is the thing that people don't realize. Mm. We've got generations of people still alive that started training before way before, mm. uh, during, they lived through it and after, that they can tell us how things were. So my teacher had his main teacher, it was a guy called Zhao Zhong. Zhao Zhong is my, my teacher's teacher from a uh, young age, my grandmaster, who taught him Xing Yi Quan. And uh, he, taught, he taught him Xiao Li Quan first and later on taught him Xing Yi Quan as he got a bit older. And uh, Zhao Zhong was quite well known prior to the you know, the, the change of government here, and then even during the beginning stages as a martial artist in the IDN district of Beijing. Uh, he had a recognized school. I've actually still got an old record where it's listed as one of the, one of the uh, it's in the Republican era, as one mm. of the listed training areas, uh, training locations run by Zhao Zhong. And, but Zhao Zhong was unfortunately politically aligned with the side that lost. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, and so th here you can see 
the results of your political background and actions actually resulting in how you were treated during the Cultural Revolution. So it was often used as an excuse, like, okay, yes, we are attacking cultural ideas like Chinese martial arts. But if somebody was within a community, either a nobody, not rocking the boat, or politically from the beginning, because people don't understand that uh, the, the communists that came into China weren't from outer space. They were from China. They were here. Yeah. So there were people that were on... I mean, a good example is Lu Xun, you know, the famous writer. Mm. Uh, so he was... They were considered left-wing, by the way. This is another thing that the West doesn't uh, seem to understand. Those ideas were considered left-wing during the... In most of these places where communists erupted, those ideas were left-wing, not, not the opposite. Um, in any case, uh, people that were on the wrong political side before uh, were then targeted during. It was used as an excuse. So, so some people that were nobodies or that might have been, uh, um, you know, that were supportive of, uh, you know, the, the communist uh, ideals before the takeover, even though they were martial artists, were left alone. You know, mm. so here you could take a, a look at a, a contrast with Li Ziming. Li Ziming, which is my teacher's second teacher who taught in Bagua, who was, was a very old gentleman when he passed away. He was the last living person of his generation of Bagua when he died. Um, he was on the other side of the political spectrum when they had their uh, civil war here. He was, he was on, he was actually hiding underground. He was hiding underground communists. He was assisting them to hide because they were being persecuted during the nationalist era. So for the most part, during the Cultural Revolution, he was left alone. So it's as you said, it's not as black and white. And this is just one person that I'm, I'm reciting here. This is my teacher. Yeah, yeah. My teacher was a nobody. So even though they had a difficult time training for some periods during those years, in general, these people carried on training. His, unfortunately, his teacher, Zhao Zhong, was persecuted heavily. And uh, most likely, his, uh, his, death, his early death was a result of beatings and his, his, his kidneys got damaged from Red Guard beatings and mm. that led him to an early grave. But the other side of it is Li Ziming, who had a long life. So here you've got a total contrast. No excuse for what, it, what happened. So people shouldn't get this wrong. But it's a lot more complicated than what people think. Yeah, that, 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 I think that's just the point that I, I wanted to try and get across is that, yeah, like things are never so black and white. And, um, you know, you can't really just assume that sort of all martial art masters were anti-communist or were persecuted by the communists. I mean, you know, the situation is very complicated and people, as people get into different ideologies, that doesn't necessarily say anything about what they do in other aspects of their life. You know, politically, they, they, they support communism, but, you know, at the same time, they enjoy practicing martial arts and other people politically right. oppose communism. So it's a very... Well, yeah. another example, I mean, here's another perfect example. My wife's grandfather. My wife's grandfather practiced martial arts his whole life and he never stopped. And he was also, he was born at the end of the Qing dynasty. Um, he, he, he actually served in Fu Zhou brigade. If anybody, if people don't know who Fu Zhou Yi is, you should look him up. He was a famous uh, military general um, during the uh, Japanese War of Aggression and then also during the Civil War. And he flipped sides. He was a nationalist and Fu Zhou Yi then became uh, uh, flipped sides to the other side. Half, for some reason, uh, I'm not going to get into that, but... My wife's grandfather served in his brigade. Mm. And because of Fu Zoyi's association, where he went from one side and then became on the other side, he was also left alone. Mm. He practiced every single day, before and during this period. Yes, things became slightly more conservative during that period. But another thing that people need to understand is that the Cultural Revolution, as destructive as it was, and I'm not saying that it wasn't, um, it wasn't a hundred years long. So... The people that lived before, during, and then after didn't suddenly get amnesia and forget all of their Chinese martial arts and suddenly there's just 
it's all gone. That's that, that's just ridiculous. It's like it, it, marijuana is a good example in the West. It's outlawed, but how many people smoke dope? Yeah, yeah, okay, exactly, exactly. So people find a way, and and these things carry on. The damage done in general, for sure, and in terms of um, in terms of the direction of, uh, of or the common understanding of the direction of how martial arts would go, it's a, it was heavily affected. Yes, w- we can be sure about that. But you've lived in China long enough to know that this place, in reality, is like the Wild West. You know? Yeah, of course. People think it's it's draconian and laws are so. But you know, the people here, and it's nothing new have always skirted on the edge of laws and found a way. I mean, they've always found a way to do something that they want to do irrespective of laws. It's just it's just the way things were here and it still are. And so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's all, it's, it's definitely always been like that. And I, I don't, you know, think that that much has really changed on the grand scale of things from, you know, from no. the past to now. Um, you know, despite what what people might think. Um, okay, so my next question then is because the purpose of doing uh, this series of, of interviews that I, that I want to do is to try and give an insight for people that either are unable to come to China or people who want to come to China and don't know what to expect. So, um, yeah, maybe you could say something about your experience training in China, like what people what people should expect if they want to come over and train or if they can't come over and train and they want to hear about what it's like? Well, I think uh, the first misunderstanding is that there are... I mean, I still get messages, and you probably do too, from strangers saying, hi, I'd like to go to China. Which school should I go to? That's the first big uh, misunderstanding. It's not like the West. It's most actual traditional martial arts you know the credible teachers and most practitioners don't train in a formal school so unless you're 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 trying to go to um the sport route and go to one of the academies that focuses on that which again they're not all over the place either uh you're not going to find it by going into a yellow pages and looking up a uh, kung fu school you know and there's one down here and they go they have class Monday and Wednesday from 6 to 7 p.m. That's not how it works, and it never worked like that, really. For the most part, the first thing is that uh, if you're doing traditional Chinese martial arts, you either got to know somebody or get an introduction by somebody. That's just how it is, because the community is like that. Um, Yeah, sure, you could go to a park. You might find a teacher there, and you could approach him. Uh, You could do that, too, but for the most part, it's not that simple. You know, um, you're going to have to either know somebody, get an introduction, know who you're looking for. Maybe they have a contact method and and you'll have to go to wherever they train. Usually a lot of um, Chinese, especially the older generation, but it's still carrying on now. There's usually a locality or, you know, a place that they've been training for 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 many, many years. It Mm -hmm. might even be the place that they studied with their teacher. And a lot of the time, it's public spaces like a park or a community uh, open square or, or something like that. So that's the second thing that uh, Westerners are going to have to understand when you come to train here. Uh, you're going to be training in places like that out in the open for the most part, sometimes more out of sight, sometimes not. Sometimes uh, where there's not many people, but in some places or in some instances, for the most part, there are a lot of people around you. So uh, that's that's the thing. So, And I found that Westerners actually have a tough time with that. They kind of are a little bit more self-aware and self-conscious. But that's not how the culture works here either. No one's really so self-aware when they're practicing because mm. that's just how everybody has to practice. Yeah, you get a lot of attention, places. don't you, when, you, when you're practicing in, in the park. And yeah. I think that's quite off-putting yeah. for a lot of people. Right. Well, the other side of it is like you, you get a lot of attention mostly if you're a foreigner and there's not that many foreigners training in that place that you are. And that dies off if you're there for a long time. You just become another one that they've seen over and over again. So, yeah, I, I guess I guess if you're coming here for short stints, you might get a lot of curious eyes from passers-by. But if you're staying here like you did, like I did, 
uh, you just become one of the you know the people around there mm. that are used to seeing you so they pay less attention to you at passes mm. so that's that's the the second thing um i would say that uh, the training method depending on the teacher is gonna you're gonna have to be prepared for less structure in terms of what we understand as a structured class so it's not going to be like, all oh, right, 8 a.m., let's start warming up together. Now go on to push-ups and now go on to sit-ups and let's stretch. It's not, no one's going to really do that for you, you know. Um, yeah, there's a lot of self-motivation. Yeah. Right. So the teachers, you're going to, if they, if you're training with them, for them it's it's a daily thing of their life. They're, they're as much in that place for their students as they are for themselves. And I don't know if your teacher was the same, but mine, irrespective of having somebody come to train, he was going to go down to that spot every day at that time anyway. So he was doing his own things, whether you're there or not. And uh, a lot of the time during your time with him, he's also going to be doing his own things. He's not really going to be 100%. You know, we're used to this micromanagement in the West. Yeah, it's not going to yeah. happen here. Quite often you're just left to it, like, you know, just do, you know, he, he's doing his training, some people are doing their training, and you're just kind of left to do your own thing. And I've seen a lot of people, Westerners that have come over to train and they've got quite bored or, or frustrated or, you know, they felt kind of annoyed that like, well, why am I, you know, I'm paying to be here or, or, or whatever, why am I not right. getting this, this, this attention or why am I not being pushed? Right. And that's another interesting conflict between well, um, mentalities between the East and the West. I've seen it when a couple of foreigners have come and my teacher and, you know, he's, you're doing your own thing and, well, he's told you to do something and he's left you to it then. And he's gone off and maybe he's doing something else. He's left you to it. And um, the, the Westerner will then stop doing whatever he was doing because the teacher's left him to it. And the Westerner's mind is like, oh, okay, so they just stand around there, you know, not knowing what to do. And and from an Eastern, like my teacher's point of view, when he sees that, in his mind, you're lazy, you know. So that that's that's something that uh, you got to understand. No one's going to spoon feed you here, mm. right? If you want it, you're going to have to you're going to have to do it yourself. So, you know, as far as he's concerned, that's your training time, right? That's not his training time in terms of what he, what he owes you. That's you putting time aside for yourself to train. Mm. He's there and he's going to help you. But you're, you're in charge of your training time, not him, if you get what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. It's, it, it's exactly the same experience as, as I've had. So, yeah. Um, and also, you know, people are talking about, about sparring and, and um, this is, I think this is completely related to this whole, um, this whole topic is people saying about sparring or lack of it in China. But again, I think that's something that's really up to you. Like if you want to spar, then you need to go and spar. You know, it's not up to a teacher to say to you, okay, guys, we're all going to put gloves on and spar now. Right. Well, in my case, like it, w it was always coming from us as the students, you know, uh, we would we would just arrange amongst ourselves. OK, tomorrow, let's all take our, our gloves and our and our gear. And uh, then we'd get there and we'd, be, we'd do our, you know, I mean, training. That's the other thing, people. I don't know what your training uh, uh, periods were like or sessions were like, but ours would go on for two to three hours. So, um they're going to be longer than normal. So we do our, the bulk of our training. And then at some point, you know, with my other brothers there, we'd say, okay, uh, let's do some sparring. And we'd, uh, we'd tell my teacher, is it okay? You know, you're, you're, we're going to spar. And of course he's going to say yes. He'll never say no, but he's not going to come out and say to you, all right, guys, today you're going to spar. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. He's, yeah. They, they, they're, they're going to be more, more following what you feel like doing in general. I mean, I've had my teacher most of, because I trained a lot of the time outside of times when others were there. I spent a lot of time alone with him. And those were times when he'd be like, okay, I want to work on this application today and come and do this today. And then it was a little bit more uh, focused on 
telling me, okay, we're going to work on how to use these things. But um, for the most part, when they, when it was up to us leading, for example, the sparring thing, we, we decided amongst ourselves that we felt like doing that that day, and he would never, he wouldn't disagree. He'd say, go for it, and then he, and then he'd be all over us while we're doing that, giving us you know pointers and telling us what's right and wrong and what what to look out for. And yeah, so that's generally how it is. Yeah, and and also I think you know another another misconception people have is about the the teacher student relationship and things like you know the baisha ceremony and lineage. Thought maybe you could um, you could share some insights on that. Well, I mean my my personal um, you know people are are. Again, they're simplistic in their views on these these issues. You know, they, they, they try to say, oh, lineage is therefore skill. No, that's not the case either. Um, or, or, or that magically you're going to get knowledge outside of a lineage. Well, that might be possible, but it's seldom. So lineage is, okay, it's just literally a line of knowledge. I mean, that's in general what lineage means it's a line that comes from a source of knowledge so uh, if you have a, a traced lineage that's that's confirmed all it means is that you should have access to good information right or you know uh, relevant information what you're studying that doesn't mean that every single link along that line of the lineage has a either the ability or the knowledge as in line exactly with the previous generation, he might be less or more skilled. Um, so it's not not a guarantee of anything in that regard. But it is a formal aspect in terms of. Well, I think I've used this even when we've discussed before. It's like you can live with a girl for many many years and treat each other like uh, like husband and wife, right? And 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 one could say the same thing about a marriage certificate that. You don't need a marriage certificate to know how to treat one another, right? Mm. You should know how to treat one another in line with that irrespective. But once you go through that ceremony, and once you have that uh, marriage certificate, suddenly, in terms of your own attitude towards things, you take it a little bit more seriously. I don't know whether it's uh, psychological, it probably is, but it's just a formality in a sense that starts to make people act in a more serious and connected way. So when you actually go through a baisha or a disciple ceremony, that's not to say that you've received or you're at any level or, or a, a representation of your skill level or knowledge base. It's to say that the relationship between you and your teacher is different. It's not the same as, as other people. It, it means that this is now a little bit, you've got to take it a little bit more seriously. It denotes a relationship. And more importantly, it denotes a responsibility, just like a marriage certificate or a, you know, a formal uh, civic union. I mean, the, you, 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 you mess around in terms of uh, the responsibility uh, while you're going to have legal ramifications with regards to uh, marriage. But in this regard, it, this is just... That, that is its basic point, you know? So, not everyone does it. I mean, I, I'm not saying that everyone has to do it, but it was done traditionally for this. And that terminology that we use of shirfu, where the second character is father, mm. is, supposed to denote, is supposed to denote that relationship too. You can know and study with a lot of men in your, in your life, but you only have one father and your relationship your father is slightly different to anybody else so you know that th these are all aspects that are both tradition but they also have a function we could say that these traditions are outdated we could say that they're not connected with western methods that you kurto or kowtow and uh, but actually no these are important points that denote a relationship between you and your team and set it they actually formalize it and at the same time, if you're saying that you're doing something that is a traditional uh, practice, uh, a traditional model, you got you got to have some you got to have some aspect of the tradition that you want to maintain. So, um, useful or no useful or useless is is a separate topic. But if we're talking about carrying a tradition forward, 
well that's part of it too yeah i think that that marriage thing was a really really good analogy to it and i think you really hit the nail on the head with it there because i know this this discussion comes up a lot on online and there's a lot of i guess misunderstanding about what these things represent um i think the issue is because you know martial arts chinese martial arts are something that's come from from china and from that environment and that um society that in the west without necessarily knowing all these um you know knowing the ins and outs of chinese society it's very easy to misunderstand or misinterpret you know what these things represent or what they're all about so yeah, i think that was a really nice analogy there yeah, I mean, we, we sometimes uh, criticize uh, cultures, practice, cultural practices outside of our own, own culture as being silly or unimportant when we don't even realize we have the same things just packaged differently within our own cultures. And uh, a perspective like that might help people understand it and realize that it's actually the same thing. You know, when we use terms like Xinyi Quan, when you use a term like Tai Chi Tang Lang Quan, when you use a term like liang shi ba gua zhang or even ba gua zhang, whether you like it or not, you are actually referring to lineage. There's, right. There is no way, you cannot divorce the idea from lineage, from style. It's just not possible. Because when you're talking about xing yi quan, for example, when we talk about xing, xing yi quan, we are talking about the practice that was originated from li luo nong. And the only way you can get it is by some connection to that line that came off Lilona. It cannot be Xing Yi Quan if it's not connected to that. So it's the same with Ba Gua Zhang. Even if you're learning it from a DVD, unless the guy is lying to you and he's inventing nonsense, even if you are learning it from a DVD, you are in somehow connected to the original lineage, whether you like it or not. Now, you know, we could have arguments about what's... Um, What's the best way to study, uh, and which which version or, or which uh, which method is uh, is has has created more skilled people, people that are done uh, by ceremony or people that haven't, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that's not really the point here. We're just talking about, as I said, the marriage thing, and then we're talking about a practical point of view. You are referring to the lineage when you talk about a style, so. If somebody is criticizing and saying lineage is nothing and not important, but at the same time he's advertising, I teach traditional uh, Liang style Ba Gua, he's a hypocrite. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's yeah. just, that's it. There's no other way to put it. Mm. So, yeah. Okay, so that's pretty much everything that I thought about asking you. Is there anything else that you want to discuss? Any other um, things you want to mention? Um, well, I mean, in today with, with, with the recent occurrences, <laughs> this whole Mabao Guo thing that happened, um, you know, it's actually quite interesting. And this is just uh, this is just chit chat. But I, you know, the, the video obviously got posted within my my teachers' uh, students' WeChat, you know, and you know, I saw the thing. You know, and uh, all right, cool. He got punched in the face a couple of times, end of story. But it's really interesting if you watch how close to Chinese martial artists' heart it is. I mean, the discussions that carried on after that video within the WeChat group went on for pages. Wow. And It's funny because I've not even it seen like, it posted on, on WeChat, actually. Well, I, I didn't see any official channels that it was posted. Maybe it'll get deleted. Maybe, but, um, yeah. Yeah, within groups, like our my group, I was just like, guys, you know, why even waste your time talking so much about it? There's nothing to unpack here. It was a deluded old man who finally got the check that his mouth wrote out cashed on his ass. That's what happened there. There's not much to talk there. We knew the guy was... Um, obviously not not competent in combat we knew the guy ran his mouth and and made this problem for himself for years we knew the guy was misleading and deliberately lying about things 
most likely there's some mental problems there. I've always thought that about him from the way he talks and, and the way he carries on. Well, I was reading um, Peter but, Irving's um, article this morning. I think you posted it up first and I shared it on my page. And yeah, he, he, he um, had that idea as well. He had that theory as well. Well, like I said, uh, when we, we started this with this whole soft power thing and, uh, you know, when you, when you have an environment that uh, has, there was no pushback against people making such claims, of course, the lunatics are going to rise to the top. I mean, that, that's just how it is, you know? So if no one's checking somebody that's making a somewhat, you know, ridiculous claim, for fear of looking like they're going against the Chinese people or they're against Chinese culture or they're supporting Western whatever or whatnot, then the lunatics that are the most deluded are going to be the loudest because that's just in their nature. So, you know, this is, this is, this is, what, this is what happened. So, yeah, I, I always thought that just looking at him and what he was saying, it's like there's something wrong, you know. He's, he's, not, he's not a full box of chocolates. So. Yeah. Yeah, I don't see. I don't see why it needed so much discussion. It's very simple. He got punched in the face, I think, four times, and on the fourth one, he got knocked out. Mm-hmm. For me, as I said in, in in the intro to our podcast that I released today, um, I just couldn't believe this thing went down the way it did. You know, I've arranged enough of these kind of uh, sporting events to know that that right there, the way that that was arranged, especially with a seventy-year-old man. That was totally irresponsible, like totally irresponsible. And if somebody died, all of those people involved should definitely get the full force of the law against them because that was completely irresponsible. Mm. If he's adamant on having a fight, fine. Make sure that the environment is correct. Make sure you've got medical support there. Make sure you do all your checks that you need to. Have an ambulance on site for God's sake, you know. Yeah. You've got to do things right. Well, if he, You don't want an old man, deluded, crazy, full of shit, to die because of that. You know what I mean? Mm. So, for me, that was the biggest shock uh, about all of this. You know, Sanda, which is a competitive uh, sport with, with lots of checks and balances before we have an event, mm. has an age limit of 40. Wow. You know? Yeah. It used to be 35. It's only it was only pushed to forty when I was in the technical committee because some guys that have gone over thirty five said that they they still feel like they can fight and that's fine that's reasonable mm. but forty is already considered pretty old in 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 combat mm. here you've got an almost seventy year old man and I'm, I'm I just can't for the life of me understand how the organizer of such thing uh, didn't think that there might be a fatality on the day you know so, yeah yeah. But don't you think, I mean, you said you, you, don't, you, you didn't really understand why there was so much discussion in um, Chinese yeah. forums and things, but don't you think that, that um, okay, an old man getting beaten up isn't good, but the fact that it's allowing this conversation will be a reality check for a lot of people because there's only so many of these deluded people that can continue to get knocked out before people can, you know stop believing that okay doing a bunch of forms and and some qigong exercises or whatever will will prepare them for a fight and that well you know won't this stimulate a conversation that will force martial artists in china to um you know think twice about how they're training or why they're training yeah i'm not saying that i'm against the look he was adamant on fighting I'm not saying that this shouldn't be this should be shunned or whatever. What I'm saying is that I can't believe it was arranged so irresponsibly. So mm-hmm. yes, I agree that this should happen. Uh, not necessarily. I think at some point the old man should have had a student. If he's so great, surely he's got a student that he's developed uh, that is good enough to represent him. But okay, that's neither here nor there. But you know. Um, I, I think you're right, and, and this is what Xu Xiaodong has been doing for the last few years, is trying to... Two things. One, uh, he was directly going against charlatans. So this this is Ma Bao Guo's uh, camp right there, right? I mean, Ma Bao Guo is, is the epitome of a charlatan, unfortunately. Um, 
but two, as you said, it'll show people that uh, you know you can't. You, if you're going to fight, there's a lot more to what you need to do to prepare for that. You know, to have fighting ability and uh, standing in Jan Duong for eight hours at a certain time between a certain time and putting your tongue in a certain position in your mouth is not going to help. So yeah, I, I you know I agree that 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 this is the only way that it'll get. Uh, It'll get shown up. You know, I always thought that after the whole Shusha Dong explosion, that some guy, if he was clever, should have arranged in Hong Kong or Macau an amateur UFC one type event. It wouldn't have been allowed to take place here. That's for sure. Mm. It would have blocked it left, right, and center. But you know what? Let's do it. You you basically just copy UFC one and you hold it in Hong Kong or Macau and let anybody who's running their mouth sign up and come and prove it. Yeah, I mean yeah, a couple yeah. of editions of that, and it'll it'll end this thing pretty quickly. It'll mm-hmm. end it, mm-hmm. and you could you could make sure you've got the medical people in place. You can you can do everything that you need just to be sure that there's no uh, excessive uh, injury that uh, doesn't need to be doesn't need to happen. So I'm just surprised no one's done that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me, yeah, me, me too. I guess, yeah. Yeah, so I think we can probably end it there then. We kind of uh, ended right where we started, which was about Mabalgwa. So kind of a nice, nice end, I guess.